You know, I sometimes think that people register thinking that the only way they're going to be able to watch the recording is if they registered. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November Hot Topic. I'm Trish Neely, the League of Women Voters of Tallahassee President, and I want to thank Katie Bonnet, our Vice President, for pulling together this amazing election roundup with um, with three experts from across the political spectrum. Before we begin, I do have a few announcements. First, um, I want everybody to save the date. December the 10th is our holiday luncheon at Capital City Country Club. And be watching the voter for, uh, for details that will be upcoming. And if you're not a member, um, if you would like to join our voter mailing list, you can do so from our website. It is lwvtallahassee.org. December the 12th begins the first week of interim committee meetings in advance of the 2020-2023 general sessions. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the Tallahassee League is also Lobby Corps for the state of Florida. So we're the ones that, <clears throat> to, that get to descend on the Capitol and talk to our legislators and uh, promote the League's agenda. I would ask that you please keep your video on and your sound uh, muted. Uh, during the presentations. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in chat. Katie and I will both be monitoring and there will be ample time at the very end to answer all of your questions. And let's see, anything else? With that, I would like to introduce my favorite political consultant and mover and shaker, our Vice President Katie who is going to introduce our guests and facilitate for us. So Katie, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Trish. Um, I am super excited to be here today, hosting you all via Zoom um, for this awesome conversation. One week uh, is very timely post midterms here in Florida. Um, I had been planning on doing this for a couple months now, and I'm um, just super excited to have uh, several experts um, that I happen to know. One that is new to me, but certainly not new by association, and uh, so we can talk a little bit about what happened and people's thoughts and feelings and opinions. Um, feel free if you do have questions, we'll open it up hopefully towards the end um, if uh, we have some time, if you guys have some follow-ups to anything we discussed or any questions that you showed up with. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce all three. Um, so I'll go up the alphabetical order by last name. Um, first up is uh, Reggie Cardozo. Um, I uh, met Reggie in the 2014 election um, and super close with his now wife. He has a beautiful family. She was my roommate for a spell and I worked with her a couple of times. Um, he is the president of the Public Square LLC. Um, many of you all might remember his name. Um, he successfully ran Jim Daly's campaign and was part of both uh, um, presidential elections when Obama won the first and second time. So welcome, Reggie. Reggie, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're happy to have you. Um, next up is Daniel Griffith. Um, he is the Senior Director of Policy at Secure Democracy. Um, he's going to be our elections expert. He's an expert in election policy in Florida and Texas, two very interesting, sta interesting states on both fronts. Um, and I know he'll tell us a little bit more about Secure Democracy, one of my favorite organizations. I uh, have a close friend that made his way over there. Chris knows him too. <laughs> um, so welcome, Daniel, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. And uh, Chris Stromberg, someone um, who I, I've met and gotten to know better recently. He works for Americans for Prosperity Florida. Um, he is their legislative affairs director. He's also an attorney that has a lot of experience um, here in Tallahassee and Tallahassee native, if I'm not mistaken, right? I think you did. All right. That's very cool. Um, uh, I, I've, I've worked with AFP this past couple of years to pass some pretty awesome legislation related to probation. Uh, awesome team to work with. 
I'm sure to work for. And uh, many of you also might remember them from um, their successful working with us and several other groups to pass Amendment 4, which I know is very important to the league and them and others. So welcome, Chris. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Awesome. All right, so um, I'm gonna kind of ask uh, a question for everybody and you guys can kind of decide how, <laughs> you know, just feel free to chime in and we'll do our best to kind of pace it. Um, and then I'll, I have some questions specifically for each of you, depending on your specific roles this past election and previous. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my first question for everybody that would like to weigh in is, um, what was the biggest surprise for you during this past uh, Florida midterm election, or even your respective organization, if you'd rather speak for them. Um, I'll go ahead and hop in. Uh, the biggest surprise for me, um, and and really, I think the biggest surprise for for AFP Florida was, um, uh, I mean, really, kind of just just what happened. You know, we had a huge red wave um, in Florida. Um, that really didn't materialize anywhere else. And, and Americans for Prosperity is in 35 states across the country. Um, so, uh, you know, we, as we, apologies, thought I had turned my phones off. Um, uh, as we came into election night, you know, we we felt pretty good um, about a lot of our candidates, but but we kind of assumed that we, we, we probably weren't gonna go uh, bat a thousand um, on election night, which we we ended up doing in the general, um, but we also thought that a lot of our sister states would uh, would do decently, and uh, that's uh, that's not how it turned out. You know, we batted a thousand, and a lot of them didn't do quite as hot, and that was uh, quite a surprise for us. Yeah, I think I think just piggybacking off of uh, of what what Chris said, I, I would agree. I think. I, I'm not as surprised, you know, sort of um, that Republicans had such a great, great night on Tuesday night. Uh, I'm a little surprised that um, that they have super majorities in both chambers of the legislature. Uh, I, I think in talking with sort of my colleagues and, and some friends that I have on the other side of the aisle, I think folks thought they were going to have a good night. Uh, I'm not sure they thought they would have that good of a night legislatively, right? Um, uh, I'm also a little surprised on some of these local amendments and, and charter amendments that that passed um, that most folks didn't see across the state passing um, or some that were supposed to pass that didn't, right? Um, uh, but yeah, I think I think the biggest sort of surprise for me and, and for some of the folks that I that I chat with regularly is that they did so well. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the uh, and they have a super majority in both chambers and and I think there's some operatives I, I know on the Republican side that say that's a little bit more difficult because there's more mouths to feed right so uh, they, they would want to get close to a super majority but not actually there um, but that's that that would be my analysis in terms of a surprise. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just say for our organization, um, you know, we're, you know, just to give a little context, so Secure Democracy is active in legislative advocacy around elections in 19 states. We'd identified 14 uh, in the run up to the election that we were kind of monitoring in terms of how election administration was going to go. Would there be also any separately any issues around election denialism or anything like that, given you know, the tenor of the past couple of years? And I would say the surprise uh, for us was really how, you um, you know, really, despite the fact that Florida elections were bracketed by hurricanes uh, in this situation and all the challenges with respect to that, that the elections were really went very smoothly, uh, even in comparison with a lot of other states that we were monitoring. And I think that's a testament uh, to uh, the supervisors um, all across the state who have always been key allies for us. And we really, you know, in our work over across all the states, we've always really considered for supervisors to be kind of superstars in the election administration sphere uh, nationally, and they certainly lived up to that reputation in this election as well. I, I will say one more thing that uh, Reggie actually brought up that reminded me personally, I was incredibly shocked that all three of the amendments failed um, on the on the ballot this year statewide. That was like a, a gigantic surprise to me. I, I, I was thinking the same thing when when Reggie flagged that, um, and you know, to kind of put that in perspective too. Two years ago, uh, 
you know, a minimum wage passed, even though Republicans had. Uh, so, you know, like I, it's, it's the amendments is always, I feel like a much more of a roll of the dice. Their lot was predictable. So yeah, ex excellent point. I was thinking the same thing. Um, well, all awesome answers. Um, I'm going to shift now to a directed question. We'll go with Reggie first. Um, and I know this is an audience, uh, if they didn't know that, that you worked on Jim Daly's campaign, they were I was certainly very involved, right? We've got all Tallahassee residents for the most part in the surrounding area, and certainly that know um, Daly and, and, and Dozier well. Um, so uh, based on your previous campaign experience on both Obama campaigns, we worked on the Chris campaign um, towards the end of 2014, um, what drew you to the Jim Daly campaign? So for jo so John, John, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry. That's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I typed it wrong. <laughs> no, uh, Mayor Daly has been uh, a personal friend and and is sort of a strategic ally um, in a lot of my roles that I played. When when I was in the administration, he was super helpful. Uh, one of the one of the folks in Florida that was super helpful. Um, uh, you know, he was. Uh, most folks may not know this. He was, uh, him and his wife, Ginny, were um, very big supporter housing for a lot of our uh, campaign folks in 2008 uh, and 2012. He was an early Obama supporter. Um, uh, um, and so uh, I've known him for a long time. Uh, I, I like helping my friends out in, uh, in elections. I'm lucky that I get to work with a lot of my friends and I don't have to work with a lot of people I don't know. Um, and so it was just an easy decision, um, you know, for me and, and I offered my help and, and he obviously uh, uh, took me up on it. And we, you know, he, uh, you know, it was a very tough, very, very hard, much harder campaign than we anticipated, put it that way, than I anticipated. Awesome. And again, apologies for um, right. John Daly, my bad. And congrats, certainly on the win. Um, just as a follow up um, for those on that, can you talk a little bit about what supporter housing is? <laughs> um, because yeah. I, have, <laughs> so, you know, when I worked on Republican campaigns, yeah. it was so not a thing. It's definitely. <laughs> so in much, and, and it's typically in, in, in the presidentials, we don't do it as much um, um, in, um, in some of the gubernatorials and statewide, but obviously there's, there's hundreds of field staff that come on the ground, right, that are run through the Democratic Party and put around the state and supporter housing are individuals who literally open up their doors and let and let a lot of these kids live in their houses or their guest houses or their extra rooms or their garages and uh, and, you know, and uh, typically end up feeding them a lot and housing them. And it's 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 pretty it's it's a it's a pretty very big gesture when it comes to that stuff. So. Totally. Well, thank you for that clarification. Thank you for that answer too. And and very cool. I did not know that about 2008 about him. Oh, that's, were, that's, yeah. that's very interesting. I didn't I didn't know he was a big Obama supporter. So mm -hmm. um, thank you. I'm going to shift it over to Chris. Um, so AFP Florida had an impressive track record for both the Florida primary and the general midterm election you just had. Um, how do you think this will translate into AFP's 2023 Florida legislative priorities? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, we had so we engaged across the primaries and the general in 39 races. Uh, we won 37. Uh, like I indicated, we we had two primary candidates that that ended up not winning, um, but we then we then did pretty well on general election night. Um, I would I would go back to actually what Reggie said earlier. Um, the same thought thought process has occurred to us um, as, as a lot of Republican operatives. Um, you know, having having a majority is nice um, because generally uh, a lot of our policies uh, tend to be viewed pretty favorably for the most part um, by uh, the Republican members. Um, but having a super majority opens up some really odd um, some really odd interactions, uh, especially when it's both both chambers that have a super majority. Um, and when you have a governor who's who's looking to potentially run for president in two years, uh, it, it opens up even more odd interactions um, with that super majority. So um, we're, you know, we're pleasantly optimistic um, on a lot of our uh, legislative priorities. You know, our big focuses this year are going to be in the uh, K-12 foundational education area, um, healthcare, and then economic opportunity, which covers a whole host of things from 
um, uh, occupational licensing uh, over to uh, corporate welfare um, and cronyism. So um, we think in general, you know, the legislature is going to be relatively favorable to a lot of our uh, a lot of our thought processes and a lot of our bills. Um, but with the supermajority, like Reggie said, it's really just tough to tell. Um, you know, it, it opens up the ability for for things to kind of get derailed by a, a number of folks uh, throughout the process. Great, thank you for that. <clears throat> and I, I will say that was something I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how you all operate in 2023. Um, you all were such great partners and I think of uh, many groups. I, I always thought that AFP Ford is like one of the most self-aware, like you guys kind of know where you can help and know where you can't. And um, everything that you said about, you know, our time leading up to and the year that we tried to get a bill passed together, um, you guys called it before it happened and you were accurate, like at least 90% of the time. So I always found that to be really impressive. So um, hopefully in some of that occupational licensing or maybe further down the road, we can work together. Like you said, you guys are really great in criminal justice reform too. And, and I know that crosses over to let me work workforce stuff. Um, so shifting to Danny, a little more election specific stuff. Um, uh, do you think the election laws passed in Florida in 2022 and the newly created Office of Election Crimes and Security affected turnout in the midterm uh, and why or why not? Well, um, I think I'll give you the lawyerly short answer and say that it's too early to tell. Um, but uh, in terms of, I mean, it's clear, uh, at least, you know, results are still unofficial, obviously, uh, you know, local certification isn't even going to happen until later this week. Uh, but it sure seems apparent that there was a downturn uh, in terms of turnout, uh, certainly in certain portions of the state. Now, to the extent that the new laws had an effect, I mean, I could certainly, you know, once we have final data in, uh, there could be some observation points around, um, you know, turnout of certain demographics going down if there's possibly concern about interaction with the new Office of Election Crimes and Security. Um, there may also be data about just general downturn in usage of voting by mail, um, as opposed to some other methods uh, if people you know, we're having a um, little bit more difficulty in terms of ballot return because of the new regulations around um, not drop boxes, secure ballot intake stations. Um, and, um, you know, obviously uh, some other aspects of, you know, increased penalties for, you know, certain activities by third party organizations may have, um, you know, eliminated some assistance that voters may be counting on in terms of registration or in terms of completely completing their ballots as well. So I think once we get all of the uh, data in um, and to the extent that we can, you know, separate some of these issues out as independent variables, as opposed to, you know, all of the other things that can affect elections, I think there certainly is a possibility uh, that we are going to see changes in voter behavior based upon, you know, stricter regulations about voting by mail and certainly greater concerns about interaction with law enforcement when someone's trying to cast their ballot. Very helpful. And just to just a mini follow up question there, um, and I you scratched the surface, but as it related to you know the twenty arrests that happened um, shortly before the the general um, from that office of elections crimes and security, um, and the coverage that it got in Florida and, and certainly nationally, um, you know, did, well, secure democracy. Did you all have a public opinion on that? Did you weigh in? I mean, what's what was kind of the re, the, the reaction from your organizations? Um, and if and if and if not, maybe you can kind of personally weigh in too. No, I mean I think you know obviously the creation of the office was a, a big uh, topic of debate. Uh, in many ways, the office was kind of the centerpiece of Senate Bill 524, which was you know the big elections bill passed this year. And we throughout the process certainly asked questions about the need uh, for you know that level of uh, law enforcement involvement given you know, no historical data indicating, you know, significant widespread irregularities uh, that would require that kind of criminal enforcement mechanism in the election space. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, there are obviously historical concerns around, you know, law enforcement involvement uh, in um, in elections, especially in the American South, um, you know, as that being a big issue that uh, can, you know, be very, you um, 
you know, can certainly coerce people to maybe participate a bit less than they would be inclined to because of that requirement. So, you know, I think based upon what has happened so far with the highly public arrests uh, and then the fallout that seems to be there are some issues there around, you know, the the intent of the people who have been charged with the, um, the offenses and what they may have been told concerning their eligibility. Also, some separate issues that look like they may need to be resolved in the, the upcoming session around um, the attorney general's or jurisdiction in terms of being able to prosecute these matters. Um, you know, these kind of remains to be seen and um, will certainly kind of remain skeptical. Uh, we also already know that the governor has asked basically to get all of the resources that he did not get uh, in 2022. Um, and given the track record so far, um, I would definitely say organizationally, we're pretty skeptical of that ask um, at this point and the need for it. Awesome intel, thank you. <clears throat> um, so let's go to kind of the second one for everybody. Um, why did the Florida election results, and we talked, I think some have touched on this a little, um, but why did the Florida election results trend so differently than the national results? I don't mind. I don't go first here. I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, I think COVID um, attracted a bunch of folks to the state of Florida based off of how the governor was governing. Um, uh, you know, it was seen as a very free and open state. I think that attracted a lot of folks from the Midwest, maybe from some more conservative folks, uh, conservative areas that uh, that weren't taking it or operating under the same policies as, as Florida. And I think the Republican Party did a, a really good job of engaging those folks. Uh, first of all, registering them. I think they're a big chunk of why um, the voter registration has swung in their favor. Um, and then I think they did a really good job of, uh, of communicating them the importance of uh, of voting and why they needed to vote for their candidates in the new state that they're in, right? Um, I think that's a big reason um, or one of the main reasons as to why we saw some different results here as, as across the state. I think the, the state of Florida is a little bit different um, composition-wise than it was three years ago. Um, uh, and that, and that in, in, to my opinion, played, played, into a, played, played a big factor into that. I also think, I will say, I also think that at the end of the day, um, Republican candidates and established and, and organizations really gave their voters a reason to turn out um, that was um, germane to why they would want to come out and vote. And I think Democrats didn't. I think at the end of the day, what you'll notice is that Democrats were talking about certainly very important issues, you know, women's rights. Um, education, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but the voters in this past cycle were voting on pocketbook issues and Dem Democrats were just not talking about that, right? Uh, and it, and I think it led, uh, it gave an opportunity for Republicans to really um, spread a message that, that, really, um, that really touched and, 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 uh, and voters understood. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with uh, everything that Reggie said, I think one of the other huge factors is um, really the two leading potential candidates for, you know, the Republican presidential race in two years, both reside in Florida. Um, so I, I think that was a huge driving factor in a, a lot of the Republican interest in general uh, in, in the Florida area. And then, um, you know, not necessarily because of that, but probably because of you know, really a lot of the election results over the past, um, you know, four to six cycles um, and the general just kind of disarray that the statewide Democratic Party is in. You had a lot of a lot of the national money from Democratic donors just didn't come into the state. I mean, you look at um, the money that was raised, uh, you know, six years ago to face Rubio, or even two years ago, the money that, um, you know, Bill Nelson was able to raise and get from the national uh, apparatus uh, was, uh, I mean, Val Demings really just didn't get anything. So you really can't compare the two <laughs> at all. 
Uh, you had a lot of a lot of Democratic groups just didn't get involved in a lot of stuff here, which further hamstrung uh, a lot of the Democratic candidates uh, throughout the state, both at a federal level and uh, at a statewide level. I mean, it, the outside of the governor's race and Charlie Crist, the other three cabinet races were uh, they were ghosts. Uh, there were I run into so many people who didn't even know the Democrats had somebody running, but for the fact that they were on the ballot. Excellent point. And and also, um, I, I will uh, throw Val Domings and her team a bone in that even with little to no national support, she still did a pretty good job raising money. I, I mean, raising and spending, but. Oh, um, yeah. It, they did, they did <laughs> but, but, but you're absolutely right. It was very different than it had been. They got no that. backup from the National <laughs> Party. And that's not, and national donors, and that's not an accusation or, or blaming don't, anybody. Don't. That's just the reality of what happened. Oh, it's agreed. I, I, I was just more giving their team props, but they, they're listening or not. But Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, Daniel, it looks like you were going to weigh in too. I apologize for. Yeah, I would just have a couple of observations. One, I think, you know, to a certain extent, um, you know, Florida really did reflect uh, certain national trends. I think uh, it was a pretty good cycle to be an incumbent governor, probably Nevada is the exception there. Um, and also, it was an excellent cycle to be an incumbent senator in a lot of places, too. I don't think any incumbent senators lost, as a matter of fact. Um, so, I mean, obviously, that played out in Florida. And I think the other thing that I would just observe in terms of maybe some of the differences is that, um, you know, in some other states, you really see some partisan differences in terms of uh, trust in and the willingness to embrace certain vote methods, uh, particularly early voting and vote by mail. Um, those differences are not really something that we observe in Florida. I think both parties really um, lean into the choices that the Florida election code offers voters in terms of the ability to allow any registered voter to vote by mail, to vote early in person, or to vote on election day at you know the voter's pleasure. And um, you know, I, I think that both parties really use that in their turnout models to you know make sure that they're working vote by mail they're working early voting they're working election day voting as well to maximize um you know bringing all their people out to the polls thank you for that um so we'll do our next question for reggie specifically um what takeaways from the mayor's race do you have as they relate to future local races in tallahassee as i know you've certainly done some others here as well yeah, I, I think, you know, listen, I think one of the things that we saw on a national level was mayors nationally this cycle, both this year and the year and, you know, the off year previously, um, incoming mayors had a tough time, right? I think that a lot of folks, you know, all politics are local, right? So a lot of folks um, maybe even blame some inflation and costs and stuff like that on their local governments. Um, and so I, I don't, I think that, you know, Mayor Daly's um, race was very indicative of that. And, you know, uh, I've seen some data that shows, you know, a lot of these similar mayors with similar cities, similar size cities uh, um, had some, had some, um, some good opposition. Uh, honestly, I think in Tallahassee, it's very interesting how this progressive group of uh of Democrats are challenging sort of the more established group of Democrats. Uh, you know, I think you'll see that happen here for another couple cycles, right? Um, uh, you know, I think that it's kind of a goes back and forth. I mean, you know, you saw um, David Bellamy lose to um, uh, Matt Lowe, who's way more progressive than he is. You just saw you know, one can argue Mayor Daley is a little bit more of the traditional um, establishment Democrats than than uh, Commissioner Dozier, right? And so um, I think that's going to be a trend you're going to see in your Tallahassee politics, um, you know, and definitely over the next couple cycles. I mean, listen, there's a big, there's some big elections coming up with a couple city uh, city commissioners that are that are on the ballot in two years, right? And I think you'll see them get get challenged um and particularly uh commissioner porter right and so uh you know i i think at the end of the day um 
I think at the end of the day, it, you'll see a little bit of sort of the same old, same old, maybe for another two cycles or so. Um, and then depending how those results go, maybe it sort of dies down because someone gets beaten down a little bit, whether it's the more progressives or whether it's the more traditional uh, party establishment uh, candidates and go from there. Very helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so Chris is up next. Um, Inquiring minds want to know, honestly, I really just want to know this one. <laughs> um, so how would a candidate go about seeking an AFP endorsement? Say I wanted to run and wanted AFP to support me. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so we actually changed things up a little bit this year. Um, so for, uh, for uh, existing uh, members, uh, typically what we do is is we already kind of know what's going on. Um, we'll go back and look at their vote record. Um, you know, we we had a couple of members who connected with us, uh, letting us know that they wanted us to specifically take a look. For the most part, we already kind of know, and we were looking at a lot of them, um, but, but it can be helpful. Um, but for totally new candidates, um, this year we had an issue survey that we sent out. So we created a, um, a little Microsoft form. I think it was a grand total of about 25 questions. Um, and the first, uh, really the first half of the form was just kind of basic info, name, address, phone number, what are you running for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we kind of dug into uh, some of our primary policy areas. So we asked people about um, different methods of, um, uh, K-12 education freedom, um, ranging from open enrollment throughout the district to uh, uh, universal education savings accounts and uh, charter school usage, uh, ask them to rank um, rank those by their like uh, opinion of what they would support the most to the least. Um, we asked them about a lot of healthcare. What do you think is the biggest issue in healthcare um, in Florida? Um, Del asked them some questions about uh, telehealth, uh, which is one of our priorities. Um, and then at the end, we also asked them a little bit about uh, what was it? Um, some of the housing affordability and insurance issues. Um, and then kind of a general catch all of like, what's the biggest issue that that we haven't talked about in the thing that you care about. Um, so they would fill those out. We sent those out to either candidates, um, consultants, fundraisers that we know, and said, hey, give these to your people and send them back in. Uh, we read through, I read through every single one of them. Uh, the other couple of members of our team, um, Danny Martinez, our director of external affairs down in Miami, and then Lee Jury, um, who's our uh, Director of Policy Operations. We all read through them. We interviewed um, the candidates. And then um, once we got a good feeling, we actually run it up through our national um, organization. They do a little bit of background on it. Um, uh, do e everything that a political consultant normally does. So they run all the social media checks and, and whatnot um, to, to flag any risks. And then uh, you know, from there, we kind of get the up or down from them um, with a couple of questions normally. And then uh, we're kind of off to the races uh, with support. They talk to us about how we wanna support people and we do it um, you know, in a number of ways. Some folks it's an endorsement only, um, but we do everything from mail to doors to phones to endorsements. Thank you for that. Uh, very transparent and thoughtful peek behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's a, that's a, that's a pretty solid process too. So, so thank you for that. Um, so and now over to Daniel, um, what does secure democracy believe is on deck related to elections legislation in Florida for 2023? <clears throat> well, I think we already know kind of what some of the priorities are. Um, for some of the movers, certainly, I mean, governor's already announced that uh, he's going to be seeking more funding to expand the office um, of election crimes and security. Um, that's not a big surprise. Uh, I think we're going to see some legislation around uh, that notion and the ability of that office to prosecute. Um, I think we're going to see some stuff around, um, you know, some of the issues that have arisen with these early um, 
arrests and the notion of you know providing notice to people when they are not eligible and then when they are eligible um, doing it more clearly and transparently which may not be the worst thing in the world um, so certainly would like to see what form that takes um, we know uh, from SB 524 that they are engaged in a um, study right now about the implementation of an ID requirement for vote by mail envelopes. Um, so I think we can expect to see some legislation around that, which we've seen implemented uh, in Texas. Uh, it's been rollout, certainly been problematic there, um, especially in the primary. Uh, we had a very big jump in terms of uh, ballot rejections. So um, we would want to be very mindful and learn from some of Texas's mistakes if the course that the legislature wants to go is that ID piece for vote by mail ballots. Um, I think another consideration there is that uh, a lot of the argument around using that ID number is the notion that signature verification is subjective, um, which if that's the feeling, then I don't see a need why we would have to have both. Um, if you want to replace signature verification with the ID requirement and leave robust cure, um, which Florida has in place, then you know, I think that's a conversation maybe worth having, but uh, I don't think layering those things on top of one another would necessarily, that's certainly not something that uh, the organization would support. Um, you know, as an organization, we're running legislation ourselves and looking for sponsors, uh, most specifically around expansion of early voting. Um, we're looking to give, um, Florida law already has um, some pretty good flexibility for local officials to really kind of feel out what the right amount of early voting is. We'd like to increase uh, that flexibility in terms of what days early voting can be offered on and the locations that early voting can be offered. Uh, we're also looking to expand to um, make some uh, minimum floors in terms of the availability of early voting for municipal elections as well, because, um, you know, obviously those are very important elections. And right now there are no real guarantees in the code that early voting is going to be available for folks during those elections, which, you know, we would anticipate being a turnout driver um, if those options were offered in those municipal elections. So that's certainly kind of where we'll be concentrating uh, for the next session. Thank you for that. And, and just as a quick follow up, um, I, I know you mentioned the other states that you all operate in. I know specifically you do a lot in Florida and um, in Texas, um, insofar as like bandwidth, uh, of how much, you know, and I know Florida, obviously being the third most populous state and, and it's got its, and, and election wise always is pretty notorious, um, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Uh, how much bandwidth does Florida take in compared, like in compared to the other states that you all operate in? Well, I mean, I think certain, so the states that we're in, we separate them into tiers. Um, Florida's tier one, um, which a number of other states are as well, um, due to its population, you know, and, and other factors as well. Um, I really, that question kind of depends on when you ask me. Um, you know, obviously, Florida's session is kind of a quick one compared to some other ones. So, you know, for those 60 days, um, there's definitely a lot of concentration in terms of kind of what Florida is doing. But, you know, when we're in interim, you know, obviously, I'm probably spending more time in Texas, since they're not out until Labor Day, or, you know, Arizona stretching into June and July now. Uh, so the end of that session certainly kind of will distract me um, when I'm not necessarily concentrating on Florida. But, you know, during session, Florida certainly getting as much bandwidth probably as any other state uh, in our portfolio. Very cool. Well, I know certainly me and this league audience looks forward to um, uh, any bills that you guys might file here related to um, the early voting expansion and some other things. So please keep us posted. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna, we're going to kind of cycle through the last round, but I just wanted to flag for everybody. We're pretty much running on time, but um, if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat and hopefully we'll get to some, if not all of those. Um, so my next question for everybody is, um, what do the election results, this midterm election results mean for the 2023 Florida legislative session? Uh, I mean, listen, I think that you kind of, uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit, like subliminally, right? Like in terms of, um, uh, you know, one side having a super majority of, uh, in both chambers, you know, um, I think that uh, it is going to be um, significantly more difficult for Democrats, especially maybe in the House, um, 
to band together and try to block legislation. Obviously, their best chance to do so is at committee levels, right? Because that's where maybe they can pick off a member of the opposing party here and there um, to help kill some bills at the committee level. Um, I don't see anything not not passing uh, on the floor uh, once it gets there, uh, clearly. Um, uh, I think that you'll see, I mean, listen, I think for Democrats, all we can hope is that uh, the Republican legislatures over, overstep, right? And, and, uh, and kind of go a little too far with, uh, with what they're trying to accomplish in this legislative session. And maybe that helps us uh, in terms of um, 2024, right? Uh, with the elections that we have in 2024, um, uh, obviously the congressional elections and uh, local elections and, and and the presidential, right? And so um, I think at the end of the day, you're going to see legislative priorities on the Republican side breeze through probably pretty quickly. I mean, unless, you know, like Chris was saying, uh, unless there's sort of some inner party politics that uh, that arise because there are so many mouths to feed, right? Like, who do you give, you know, what bills to and who you know? Who gets what leadership positions, and do bill do certain policies get uh, uh, and priorities get uh, get held hostage for some of that, right? Uh, which definitely would not be surprising to see. Um, but I think at the end of the day, they're going to be able to 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 pretty easily pass uh, pass any legislation and priorities that they have. It's just a matter of how far they go. Will um, determine sort of what happens or what can happen in, in 24. Yeah, I'd say Reggie is absolutely right. Um, I think I wouldn't be shocked to see um, two to three bills that are the governor's top priorities past the first week of session, um, that, that week of like May 7th or March 7th um, when session starts, uh, much like what happened um, Two years ago, uh, I would, uh, I, I think that, and then, yeah, I mean, I think it's really going to be, uh, it's just going to be interesting at that point to watch kind of where all the chips fall when you have, um, you know, at least on paper, you know, three really strong leaders um, from the perspective of like having super majorities in each house and a strong governor um, who's incredibly popular uh, just to kind of see how people uh, end up falling in line um, and where the where the inevitable uh, arguments do come up and, and how deep the cracks run at that point. And then, you know, is there going to be some of that dissension between uh, the the folks in the party that support the governor versus the folks in the party that support, um, you know, former President Trump, and and does that derail anything? I think um, organizationally, just thinking about election law, um, our hope would be uh, my answer will be short. Um, given uh, the success of the party in power in the 2022 elections, uh, I hope that the thought will be that there's not need for too much of a drastic change in terms of how Florida runs their elections. So maybe we won't see much in the way of uh, big reform um, uh, in certain ways. Very interesting angle. I like that. Um, haven't heard that one before. So thank you. Thank you. All Thanks to all three of you. Um, so uh, that goes for all the questions that I had pre-planned. Um, we've got one question so far in the chat, and I actually don't know the answer to this just because I haven't seen one yet. Um, I mean, I think I know what the will is here, but you all might have some more intel. Um, from Chris Ellington, are there any Florida constitutional amendment initiatives currently circulating for signatures? I, I mean, I, I, I want to say full-on recreational is, you know, in the cone. That's really the only one I know about, and I don't even really know the timeline if that's, but I'll kick it over to y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm now going to take Daniel's spot and give the lawyerly answer. There are almost certainly, um, you know, kind of like what Katie said, there are a hundred percent, there are constitutional amendment initiatives currently circulating. Um, at this point, I think it's a little bit early um, to, to know which ones are serious and which ones are, um, you know, gonna 
flame out on their own. Um, but we typically do have, you know, there, there's usually at any given time somewhere in the range of like six or seven constitutional uh, amendment initiatives that are that are out for signatures. And then it just kind of depends on who who actually gets money behind them. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with that. I think it's a little bit early, but you'll see, you know, I think you'll see some of the some of the ones that folks have been talking about, like recreational and stuff like that, pop up. Yeah, I would just add, um, based on what I've heard, um, if there's going to be anything in the election space, um, I'm hearing a pretty good amount of energy behind automatic voter registration. Um, as an initiative for 24. So um, if I had to pick one uh, that was elections related, I think that would be the one that would be most likely to get some movement behind it. So. Mm. Awesome. Thank y'all. Um, uh, Terry, our former president, uh, what's the outlook for further restricting abortion this session, expanding gun rights, home insurance, um, I do see, and this is a call out, <laughs> and I don't know, if, I know this is lunch break for Tammy, but Tammy Marcus is one of my favorite partners at the Police Benevolent Association. Um, I know recently Speaker Renner um, has already said he's in support of and several others in leadership on constitutional carry. And I know that a lot of the law enforcement groups uh, have pretty strong opinions about that as well, usually on the other side of it than, than our conservative leaders right now. Um, uh, Tammy, if you can hear me, and if you are able, maybe you can weigh in a little bit. Uh, but of course, I'm going to kick it to everybody else. But I, but that's my shout out to Tammy. I'm so happy she joined too. I think you've already seen uh, the governor also say that he's um, in support of some more restrictive policies on abortion. I think he came out last week after his big win saying something like that. So I would not be surprised to see any of that come on the table. Uh, so we don't, uh, we actually don't deal with either abortion or gun rights um, at all. So I can't really speak to either of those um, because uh, fortunately on some level, we don't, we don't have to get involved in that. Um, on the home insurance front, we are involved though. Um, we will, uh, I, I know the governor has already announced that he's, uh, planning to call a special session, uh, to deal with some of the home insurance issues. Um, uh, I think it's supposed to occur in December, although we haven't fully heard yet, um, when that special session is going to take place. Um, and, and I, I know they're looking to, to take a couple bites out of the apple, um, that they weren't able to do. Um, and do something a little bit more than really just kind of create a reinsurance fund, which is what they did earlier this year, uh, right after session. So uh, there is there is movement, there is talks on that front. Something will happen, um, you know. I, I think in early December, but until they fully until they fully announce it, I I can't really tell you when it's going to happen, and and. I couldn't tell you what exactly is going to happen, but I think they are going to take another bigger bite at trying to fix the uh, insurance affordability issue and the uh, 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 expand the market for a lot of these companies and bring some of these companies back into Florida, hopefully to to help drive down the prices. I, I Chris, you reminded me, I did have a conversation with a Senate member yesterday. They fully expect to have a special session the beginning of December. Um, and I apologize, I should have scrolled back through. It looks like uh, Tammy did hop off, but I'll be sure to follow up with her and, and keep your eyes and ears peeled on, you know, those bigger law enforcement groups too, when the constitutional carry inevitably comes up, you know, what they do or do not say about it, when that's the Sheriff's Association, that's police chiefs, that's PBA, um, because even though they are tend to be a more conservative leaning group, I know that they have strong feelings about constitutional carry. So, um, but great question and great answers. Um, Trish, uh, current pres um, and Lobby Corps, <laughs> that's, that's a tough job. Um, any dissent between the governor and the two houses? Good question.
Uh, I mean, not that I know of. I mean, I think he was pretty generous to uh, to both of those chambers when, uh, and spread some money around, even recruited some candidates, right? Like the gentleman that took out Janet Cruz, I know was handpicked by the governor. So um, uh, not to my knowledge, uh, again, I think with all of those numbers and power, it probably will bring some drama, <laughs> right, Trish? Um uh, so we'll just look, you know, sit back and see what kind of drama that is. I don't expect it to be anything big. I think, I think, I think most folks, and I have a very sort of weird stance on this. My friends in the business will tell me I'm crazy. I think most folks, both in Florida and across the country, are going to start to align behind uh, Governor DeSantis. And I think that if they actually go head to head in a primary, I think he beats Trump. Uh, and I think for Joe Biden, President Biden, you know, the best thing for him is for Trump to come out of a primary. But uh, I just don't I don't I don't see um, I don't see Trump beating DeSantis in, in a contested primary. So. I think they're all going to fall, fall in behind him. Oh, are you talking about the announcement tonight, Trish? Is that what the what will Trump tell us today? Prime time, 9 p.m. It's a bold choice. <laughs> I know. I, I can't. I can't wait to hear what he's what he's going to say. You know, and I I think if uh, if I if I just kind of I, I appreciate I appreciate your answer to to my first question, but I was just thinking in terms of last year, there was such a difference between um, the governor and the, and the houses on a couple of issues, particularly redistricting, where um, you know both both houses um, uh, made a concerted effort to to stick with what is in our constitution and to make it very fair and uh, and really pushed hard against the governor uh, with his particular approach and I and I think you know he he was able to wield his power by I believe. You know, basically saying, you know, if you guys want want me to release the money here um, for all the things that you want, um, you know, you need to support me on this. So I was just curious if there was anything like that out there maybe this year. I think uh, the the rumblings of that happening really didn't occur until like very very close to the start if not like um like after the start of session so i i don't foresee anything like that really coming to light um until we're you know until we're probably late february early march if it happens if something like that's going to happen at all it was uh that was a lot of that was very kind of under the dome inside baseball um, stuff that uh, when it when it did drop, it wasn't a full um, like kind of like five alarm surprise for everybody. Like the rumblings did come out a little early, but it was very surprising um, that they differed so vastly uh, on on what they thought. All right, well, we are getting close to time. Um, I wanna open it up. Does anyone have any additional questions or any final thoughts? Um, I we do have a few more minutes, but I wanna make sure that everybody gets back to the rest of their day in a timely fashion. Um, all right, all right. Well, if no takers, um, I want to thank Daniel, Reggie, Chris for being such amazing panelists, thoughtful, prepared. Um, I certainly learned uh, quite a bit today and i um, just so grateful to have you all uh, just one week later when a lot of people are still decompressing um, to share your thoughts. And uh, hopefully we can do this again or um, some other style of panel. We would love to have you all together or individually um, weigh in. So thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm gonna kick it to Trish if you have anything else to, to close with, but that's it for me. Thank you guys again. And thanks for everybody that logged in today. Um, I, I hope you found it as helpful as I did.
Yeah, I um, I just thought this was amazing. And um, and Katie, thank you. Thank you for pulling this together. Um, I know it was challenging, um, especially when you're, you know, just getting started with a with a brand new job, but um, but you did us proud, and I want to thank our panelists. Um, this was extremely informative, um, and I, I think we all learned a lot uh, from, from this particular exercise. And um, I would like to thank all of you who were able to join us today. And just a reminder, our holiday party is December the 10th. So I hope to see you all there. And with that, we will sign off and everybody can go to lunch, finish lunch or whatever it is that you're doing with the rest of your day. And um, thank you again, everybody for, for being present today. Bye-bye. Thank you for having us.